driving and listening to a podcast new to me called Weird Studies. I love it. And now every time I hear the word weird, I have to think about it, where it came from and and why weird is weird. Awesome podcast. Great thinking. Totally recommend it. But I was listening to it in the middle of the podcast. Some, some music came on and it was music that was really funky and I started singing to it. What is going on anyway? And thought about, can I sing to it and record and play it on my podcast? And what does that mean? And copyright and fair use and all the stuff that I don't really know answers to. But the episode was also talking about art and I was feeling playful. And so I, I recorded it, which led me to record. What is going on anyway? Oh my goodness. I can make a lot of different sounds on GarageBand and it just sort of opened up this whole world of, um, possibility (laughs) of sounds. And, oh, I love to, Um, record sounds like this. And... And, of course this recording of my own sound talking about what's coming up for us, which is this new strawberry moon in Taurus. Yum. Gets, let's get some berries and eat them up and laze around in the sun. And also let's watch TV and sleep in. If you're new here, welcome to my podcast. What is going on anyway? And if you're returning for more, welcome back. I'm your host, Anne Headley. I'm here to talk about what's been on my mind and how to navigate this next two-week new moon cycle. But first, a weather report. Spring is fully awakened. I think you really should know that after all that whining about wishing the weather was lovely and wishing I could have my tea outside, I really, really did get that wish come true. Lots of tea, lots of coffee, Lots of sitting in the sun has happened in these last two weeks. We've had some of the most beautiful spring moments. Bright, bright blue sky with these beautiful, fluffy, leaflet, leaf baby maple flowers absolutely glowing in the sunshine. Have I enjoyed it enough? Have I basked? I don't know. But it has been nice, and the flowers are giving serious celebration energy. Today, the day, the moment I choose to record, the wind is up again. And I don't know if it's just this location where I choose to record the podcast. I'm up on the second floor in my studio. And I say studio. I am struggling with the sound of doing the podcast. I'm in my movement studio. Um, and it, I'm trying to make it into a sound studio. I've got, uh, (laughs) still struggling with a mic and playing around with talking into different objects. This is a cooler. I kind of like that sound, but I'm going to pull away from that for a second. Anyway, up here, the wind is howling. And I thought this was only something that would happen in the winter months, but Up here, if the wind is blowing, the wind is howling, and the wind apparently likes to accompany me on podcast days. So here we are, me and the wind joining you for this new moon. I've known about the power of appreciation for a long time now, but I don't always practice it. I don't know why. 
I don't always do many things that are good for me. I don't know why. Maybe I don't always want to feel good. However, I was reminded recently of how powerful appreciation can be to my sense of well-being. To be present and notice something that I love and to acknowledge that to myself, maybe even out loud. I love this space. I love the way the light comes in in the springtime. I love the way the light seems to be enhanced by all of the new green leaves and everything seems to be pulsing with emergent greenness. I love imagining someone that I'm talking to right now, like I'm talking directly to you and I'm imagining you. And it's this funny leap that I'm taking from my space right here, right into your space. I love that it's miraculous. It's like magic. I love that this is something that I never even imagined was possible when I was a little girl. One day I woke up from a dream. It was one of those morning dreams that I can remember as my eyes open and right on the tip of my tongue was this. Appreciation is God's heart song. And I wrote it down. I don't typically think about God as an entity. It feels mm, very Christian to me. And I'm still running away from that um, early childhood Christianity that was oppressive. Anyway, those were the words. They felt right to me. And I knew it was true. And I pondered over it. You know, appreciation does something in me that makes me want to be here. It draws me into the present moment. It's sort of like gathering supplies for an off day. I can build appreciation and it and it makes a bridge for me in the times when I have a migraine and when I don't feel good and helps me make it through to that next moment of knowing that I can ground into the present with appreciation. And I think that's important. I think it's important to note that appreciation is a kind of abundance that we have available to us. It's sort of like if there were riches all around you, but you couldn't see them, uh, you might not think you were so rich, but actually appreciation is available to you and to me, uh, to all of us. And it really changes the way life appears. And so I'm just mentioning this to remind you to appreciate something. Just do it. If you aren't hearing about AI in the news right now, are you really even listening to the news? It seems to be a pretty hot topic right now. And of course there are varying opinions about AI and its usefulness and uh, what, how we could even think about this. What is artificial intelligence? I, I think we have to consider what is intelligence and that's really important to me. And I want to read to you an excerpt from the book I'm reading right now by James Bridle. I referenced it, I think, last time in the podcast because I was still reading it. It's called Ways of Being, Animals, Plants, Machines the search for a planetary intelligence. And of course, this book possibly counters the idea of what we consider to be intelligence in regards to artificial intelligence. We have already learned that intelligence is relational. It matters how and where you do it, what form your body gives it, and with whom it connects. Intelligence is not something which exists just in the head, literally, in the case of the octopus, who does intelligence with its whole body. Intelligence is one among many ways of being in the world. It is an interface to it. 
it makes the world manifest. Intelligence, then, is not something to be tested, but something to be recognized in all the multiple forms that it takes. The task is to figure out how to become aware of it, to associate with it, to make it manifest. This process is one of entanglement, of opening ourselves to forms of communication and interaction with the totality of the more than human world, much deeper and more extensive than those which can be performed in the artificial constraints of the laboratory. It involves changing ourselves and our own attitudes and behaviors rather than altering the conditions of our non-human communicants. There seems to be a general tone of foreboding, as if we need to be warned about something. And it sounds to me like I'm being told, if you don't watch out, AI will do things you don't want AI to do. Almost like somebody knows, and they're not quite saying what it's going to do, but that we should be afraid of it. And I want to know, what exactly do I need to be afraid of? And I'm getting sure that I should be afraid. That's clear. Let's take a few recent headlines. Here they are. Is it time to panic over AI? Elon Musk meets with Congressman Schumer to warn of AI apocalypse. Hacked Furby with AI brain shares plans to take over the world. I just have to include here that I've spent time with three and four year olds and they sometimes say similar things. Google DeepMind chief says AI may become self-aware and human-like AI is just a few years away. Just a couple more headlines here. Apple co-founder says AI may make scams harder to spot. Duh. White House reveals plans to protect citizens from danger of AI. So those are just a few little snippets of AI headlines. We need to be afraid of AI because AI clearly doesn't have our best interest in mind. And then I read this op-ed piece by Arthur Holland Michelle from The Independent, and I just pulled this quote to share with you. It's tempting to think that they are right about these predictions, but we might pause to ask whether they have a hidden motive in convincing us that we're in store for an imminent AI apocalypse. After all, a key part of their narrative is that the only way to stop bad AI is by embracing good AI, and that, of course, is their AI. Perhaps a more cautious, humanistic approach, one that looks beyond the tech realm for solutions to these problems, would be safer for everyone in the long run. And there's another quote. Remember in the news, there was a guy, Hinton, who left Google, and then he started talking about AI. This is a quote from Will Knight of Wired Magazine. Hinton says AI is advancing more quickly than he and other experts expected, meaning there's an urgent need to ensure that humanity can contain and manage it. He's most concerned about near-term risks, such as more sophisticated AI-generated disinformation campaigns, but he also believes the long-term problems could be so serious that we need to start worrying about them now. <laughs> I, anytime we are tempted to say we need to start worrying about something now, um, it just makes me laugh because um, anxiety is a funny beast, isn't it? <laughs> like, don't I worry about enough things already? Um, what else should I worry about? It seems that the fear that I understand around AI is that if AI is given free reign, AI would want world domination and eventually kill all the humans. This is simplified, I know. But the question that I have is, isn't that what humans are already doing? I mean, isn't that what we're already looking at? Are we going to blame this on AI now? Some days I think AI is just a very clean mirror that has been created so that we can see ourselves like 
yes, this is actually the world we made. This is the one where we're so interested in extraction and growth economy that we will destroy our potential harmony with the earth. We've somehow gone along with this concept that some tiny percent of people are allowed to have more resources and that the majority of the people on earth will struggle and be stressed. It can feel so absurd that we don't share resources. I do understand how complicated that might be and how it would require a massive restructuring of the way we manage our lives, but, and also aren't we approaching that point of no return? Have we already passed it? If we humans have gone ahead and detonated the countdown button, say that, that we have passed the point of no return, could we at least give peace a chance while we wait for the end? I live on a dirt road in rural Maine. We have a tiny little community here, and it's not an official community. We just live on the same dirt road, and we care about each other. I do share resources with my immediate neighbors, and I'm friendly with those a little further down the road both ways. Despite our differing political ideologies, we are kind and caring to one another. Each of our homes has at least two cars. There's basically a car for every person. Lots of days we will be in cars going to the same places, and I know we could share a ride, but we don't. I love getting in my car and listening to a podcast or calling my friend out of reach of anyone else's ears. Although, of course, maybe AI is listening. So I don't want to give up that space in order to coordinate grocery shopping with my neighbor. But what if my life were filled with more of that space, that feeling of spaciousness, and more time and more ability to be in the world as myself, because even bigger resources were shared with me? I think one of the promises of technology was that it would free up the everyday person to do less labor, and therefore we would be living with more freedom. But again, it's really important to understand how challenging freedom can be for us to handle. And again, this is why it seems important to allow young people to take the time to really decide what they want to do with their time, not just with their life, but with their time, give them the space to manage free time, lots and lots and lots of it. Development of inner authority and understanding our own creative process seems essential if we're going to meet the demands of a world ready to offer each of us the capacity that maybe AI is promising. Think about how the invention of the washing machine was meant to reduce labor. The, my dishwasher is meant to reduce labor. I'm reflecting on how I've been discovering what that means for me for a long time now. I recently looked at some yoga classes that I recorded and I was talking about inner authority and feeling it in my body back in 2021. You can find that on my teeny tiny YouTube channel if you want to follow along with a somatic practice of this embodying a sense and creating a space to explore inner authority. It's, that's at YouTube slash at Anne Headley. I think a small example of this is deciding for yourself what you think. Like, will I take antibiotics for Lyme disease, for example, but I will treat my sore throat with turmeric and honey and I can feel good about that. I don't have to fight anyone for that sense of rightness in me. I don't have to wrangle with an external authority to make the decision about what I will seek as a treatment for my body. Other aspects of life can get more complicated, of course, but I know that discovering this is a practice and that sometimes we get things wrong. And the grace in this is that we can learn repair. We can learn how to repair relationships. We can learn how to right wrongs. 
we can unlearn ways of being that we are conditioned to. How we understand all of these things seems so vital in living through the 2020s, doesn't it? I'm sensing that folks are just so afraid of what AI means that they aren't willing to enter the conversation. I had a routine visit with my primary care physician to check my thyroid levels. And I met a doctor in the practice where I go and I hadn't met her before. And there is this new service that she was using. They had to ask for permission. They're using technology to dictate the office notes. And haven't we all noticed how crazy going to the doctor in the last 10 to 15 years has been where we can't really have a conversation with our doctors because they're spending most of their time typing their notes into the computer. And meanwhile, we're there for a, a 15 to 20 minute visit. Those experiences in recent history have really made me treasure the healthcare that I get in other ways that doesn't require notes, like the talks I've had with my massage therapists. And I'm feeling that exchange of talking and listening, that seems to have been missing with that uh, need for dictating notes via the keyboard. So frankly, in those situations, AI maybe would be easier for me to deal with. I explain my symptoms. AI is programmed to be compassionate, reflect back what I said, without bias and offer me solutions based in medical science, change my dosage, for example, refer me to a specialist. I mean, it could also be horrible and irritating. Like I said, thyroid. Yes, I understand. You have a hemorrhoid. We will take care of that for you. Thyroid. I mean, you know, we're always going to have problems with whatever. But there is very possibly some kind of collaboration which might actually suit us as we create the kind of world we'd like to live in, that we're only able to dream up when our creativity meets our inner authority and we feel safe in the world. I suspect that we humans have a kind of superpower that hasn't been unleashed yet. That's my little suspicions. That's my theory. So maybe we're all needing to unlock our own complex logical reasoning and ability to interact with humans, you know? We haven't discovered our potential, especially the way we use our intuition. And you know that's a superpower, right? Just imagine for a second what life could be like if we were mostly in tune with our intuitive abilities, the kinds of connections and collaborations that would happen are mind blowing. Sometimes we just need the right people and the right communities to unlock our joy. And that is an unlimited resource. I know you know what it feels like to work on a project together with other people when joy is a primary factor, right? It's like a big party. And you know, work or maybe some other word that we haven't used for work yet could be like that all the time. People could do the things that they love. This is utopian thinking. Probably there are jobs that people won't want to do, but how fun would it be to flip the whole way we do things? And maybe I guess this wouldn't work for long, but just think here, just have this thought fantasy with me for a second. In this in-between time where maybe the whole world as we know it is ending and where money still matters, what if those jobs that no one wanted, we just decided as a society that it was so important that they would be the highest paying jobs and you would have to enter a lottery to do them? Whatever that job, think worst job you could imagine. Once we all valued it, it could be a privilege. It could be something that people would be excited to do. It isn't that any particular job sucks so much. What sucks is that we feel that we have no choice and we have to be away from our lives, our home lives and the things that bring us joy so much in order to do the sucky jobs because we have to pay the bills. 
it's really easy for me to diss men these days. We could be at the end of this long era of patriarchal power and white straight men are at the top of that hierarchy. So they are the evilest, right? But they are also the furthest away from the true riches of the earth, really. So we can feel sorry for them if we want, but mostly me, I don't want to. Anyway, those guys, they have to be really sold the whole package of needing to be workers, laborers sometimes, definitely the ones that need to go out and make something of themselves. I know this applies to anyone who practices that role in our society, but women historically have been allowed to or made to or relegated to the realm of the home. And any of us who are at all witchy, this is our kingdom. So much magic happens at home. And men have been told that is not the place for them. So how do we reconcile that? Everyone needs to have time to build a home space. And of course that can be anywhere. It's the practice of kindling a home fire, which is actually really spiritual and internal work. But we often use physical space to actualize that activity. It helps to have a safe place to sleep and to make a nest and to make food. Everyone deserves that. And if you are the person who goes out and spends most of their time in the world away from home to procure money to ensure the safety of the home, you lose that time that's necessary that is home building time. And if you're the home time person, you become dependent on some way or another or another person to bring the money back to sustain the home. And we all need both and that can be a huge challenge. I wonder, could AI free up some of that conflict of home and work? I don't know. I mean, did dishwashers make it so we don't do dishes? No, we just do it differently. Running away from being a human and doing things doesn't seem like the direction to go in. I mean, doing things is the whole fun of being in a body anyway, isn't it? I'm dreaming about local economies and connections to our unique place on earth and eating more food that's grown and produced locally. I'm curious about what thoughts my neighbors are having that might be growing in them like me and that are simply sprouting up because we have the same soil underneath us. And if AI is gathering information from us in order to learn, then we'd better give them all the information. Somehow those of us who aren't part of the algorithm must also count. AI should have to take us all into account and make sense of the complexity we represent. We aren't all just extractive growth economy capitalists, are we? We are loving beings. We are moved by beauty. We are connected to each other and feel through our hearts. We are continually amazed by nature and its resilient cycles and the wonder of all we don't know. We love the feel of the warm sun on our backs when the air is crisp and cool. If AI is going to take over, let it know our hearts. Let it know that we love each other more than we don't. And if the end is in sight, let it know that we didn't want to go. Maybe the next question to ask is how do we teach AI about us? The next time you hear an AI headline, notice if it incites fear in you. And if so, what can you do about that? It's not enough to say, I don't believe in AI or, ooh, it's not for me. This is our task. How do we let our voice be known? Perhaps this is a question for the ages. It's always been a human consideration. 
knowing that we are a being which dies, how do we make a mark and say, we were here? What if every new thing really comes into being because of love? And what if somehow the appreciation that I feel now is how I'm building this thing that I'm thinking of as the new earth? I love when I see the robin hopping through the yard. I love it when I watch my son from afar, happily walking across the greenly hayfield. I love the way the sun reaches all the way beyond due west and stays out so long as we near the summer solstice. My wish is that AI becomes the thing that makes democracy true, that the ability to take in so much information makes everyone's voice count. So I do have hopes for AI. I don't think it's going away. I think it's already been here. It's going to stay. And we have to look at the ways that we've created a world that make it so that we are afraid that AI would take over as if it has the same desire for world domination that our Western society seems to have. AI is requiring us, demanding us to initiate an inner dialogue with our internal system of discernment. We will have to decide if something is authentic or not. And it's like developing a palette. It will take time and experimentation to get it right. Think about how you know the taste of artificial flavoring. Do you feel angry and duped about vanillin versus vanilla? Grape flavoring? We know what it is. We accept it. We can tell the difference. We can make choices. And we can do this. And with that, it's time for our reading. This is the new Strawberry Moon. I love this one because strawberry season means it's my birthday time. And I'm a spring baby, and I love my birthday. I'll be 49 this year, and that makes me a baby to some and a completely older than old person to others. It's funny to be in this middle space, middle age. I find it hard to let go of some ideas about who I thought I would be by now, and hard to dream about what is yet to come, knowing what I know, and following some of the paths that I never knew I would even see. Life is so wonderful that way. We just can't know all about this mystery. It's just a big old present to be right in the moment and accept what is. My birthdays are really fun because I receive everything on that day as if it's a personal gift to me. Sun came up, Happy birthday! Flower bloom today, it's your birthday. Hawk yells overhead, thank you for the birthday wishes. So many presents. I don't know if I have the capacity yet to do that every day, but I do it on my birthday. So I'll take it. Okay, ready? Hey universe, hey God, hey knower of what can be known. What would you have us know? What will help us understand and navigate this time? And the hexagram we've received is 51, which is shock, sometimes known as shake. You can imagine being startled or, or aroused or, or woken up, even though it doesn't say waking up. So we'll stick with shock and shake and it moves to 19, which is nearing. It is a time to hold on to what you most value and take on responsibility for keeping it safe. And just for a second, think back about this AI conversation. And isn't this the time to hold on to what you most value wherever you land in the conversation around AI, it is 
forcing us, it's forcing the hand of what's important to you. What will you stand up for? What will you take responsibility for? And how will you let this time where we are collectively deciding how AI works with us in our lives, whatever that ends up meaning, whether it's legislation or personal choice, or some of us letting our voices be heard so that we can be known by however AI is gathering information. Do you know what you most value? It seems to me that over these last few years, we've all had opportunities to consider what we value in significant ways. And maybe now we're being called to action in a sense, to take a responsibility for keeping it safe. I've come to understand how important art and creativity are to me, that I will always think like an artist. And I've kept that hidden a lot, but now I feel that in order to fully value artistry and creativity in me and in others, I have to keep that part of me safe by protecting it, by speaking up for it. Like the priest who is charged with safeguarding the temple and altars from the past for the future, consider what remains constant and true when everything else is in turmoil. And I, sometimes when we get this hexagram, I do think, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to shake us up? Are we in for a shock, shock and turmoil? Maybe that's the way life is right now. Anyway, maybe after COVID and the pandemic, even though we're not after, we're, we're, we're post lockdown pandemic. And of course, we will see all of this differently in the future. But it is still a bit of turmoil. People are still having difficult decisions and conversations about how everyone manages their personal safety. And there are still conversations about masking and not masking and testing and not testing. And it is a bit of turmoil. I mean, let's just call it what it is. And it's moving to 19 nearing, but let's go to the changing lines. This is for changing line four. When the outer world is shaken up, the noble one is also inwardly shaken. She is wide awake now, quivering with awareness of the changes underway and ready to take on responsibility for restoring life to harmony. I like that last bit. I know that we feel that we are shaken up by events and the news and what's going on, but what are we shaken towards? And that is more compelling to me. Ready to take on responsibility for restoring life to harmony. And that feels like the age of Aquarius. That feels like the promise that I was promised by my um, brothers and sisters of the 60s. Another interpretation for the second line. This is riding a strong power. The fertilizing shock comes. You think you have lost something precious and are plagued by the remorse of the past. Don't grieve. Hide on the frontiers. Climb the mounds of transformation. Everything you lost will soon return of itself. Let yourself be led. You can realize hidden potential. The situation is already changing. This is not shining yet. Everything is bogged down. Release fertile energy from the cloud of confusion. Try to understand where the new impulse comes from and move with it. Something significant is returning. Be open and provide what is needed. And again, the question to ask here is, what must change? What will continue? That's an excellent question for 
this new moon time, any new moon time, but particularly now, what must change? What will continue? And there's something in that for me of needing to insist on listening to what my body needs as I follow also my desire and my passion and my intuition. Like the creative drive of hexagram one, this great growing energy comes from the source, asks for your full participation, and seeks to reach fruition and be realized. A noble one has the inner reflective depths of the lake contained within the protective accepting qualities of the earth. She is the one with endless capacity to reflect, interact, and explain, to shelter and nurture people as a parent protects a child. She has the strength and maturity, and so naturally she becomes responsible. So maybe that is about us being shaken into a call of action to be responsible for taking care of ourselves in the world, showing up as fully whole human beings, and insisting on the space that that takes. So we know that some of our systems and some of the ways that we engage in the world aren't taking into account our whole self. I mean, honestly, let's just take a look at the 40 hour work week. That requires people to push themselves into corners and make adjustments to their self care that mean that their whole self can't show up all the time. So I wonder if in the future, that actually will be eliminated, that we will create a culture around insisting on the time that we have cultivating and creating home is just as important as the time that we have working and being productive and making the economy go round. And just a little bit more about 19, nearing, also promotion, also. There is now a dynamic emphasis on inner growth. You will gain great clarity about your identity and your place in the larger scheme of things. Physical and spiritual strength will be enhanced as you sense a promotion into new worlds of self-realization. Try to develop a permanent perspective of the confidence you are now experiencing to guide you through upcoming confusion or depression. Yeah. And that sort of brings me back to what I was saying about appreciation, where it's possible to use appreciation when we have the, the mind to be able to work with that. We can gather it up as if we're filling our backpack for the hard times. It creates a sort of bridge, even if it's a shaky rope bridge from one place to another. It gives us something that we can hold on to. It's like creating a, a pattern or a flow pattern that we can sort of rest in those places of confusion and depression. And hopefully that flow is still, even if it's slow, it's still moving in the direction that we had set with our sense of gratitude because we're gratitude we because we feel gratitude to the things that we are interested in we love the things that we love and there is a flow inside of that that guides our creativity that guides our passion that is somehow a guiding force for our lives and i would say our dharma and letting ourselves at least be facing that direction when we go through the hard times really helps us when it's time to get our feet under us and start walking down our path again. Isn't it fun how when I sit here, I just have the answers. I just know. <laughs> and you know that this is me talking to myself, right? Just that's my disclaimer. 
I'm not telling you that I know how life should go for you, but I have this sense that if I listen back to myself, I will get some answers for my own damn self. In another one of my books, Myths for Change, Total I Ching, it's called Releasing the Spirit. I'm talking about hexagram 19, nearing, releasing the spirit, arrival of the new, approach of something powerful and meaningful, welcome, draw nearer and closer. Nearing describes your situation in terms of something approaching, particularly something great approaching something smaller. It is the first arrival and point of new contact. The way to deal with it is to move towards what is approaching without expecting to get what you want immediately. Look at things with care and sympathy. Welcome the approach of others. Keep your expectations modest. This contact opens a whole new cycle of time. It is particularly favorable for what is growing. So beware, trying to rush to completion and an early harvest will cut you off from the spirits and leave you open to danger. So nearing warns of the eighth month and uh, a harvest too soon in a lot of these interpretations. And so there's something about that knowing that something is beginning and that we won't see the completion of it right now. That's not the point of now. So the point of now is the approach, the way that we enter a space, the way that we also bring our ancestors into what we're doing. So this really isn't just about us. So to bring it all together, my interpretation is that right now is a time for considering what really matters to you, whatever that might be. It might be the soil, it might be the trees, it might be children, it might be libraries. What is the thing that means something to you, that you value, that you are called to be the protector of or the protectress of? What is the thing that you are willing to take responsibility for as we move into new earth time? What will you say, yes, this, I'm taking responsibility for this, not because I think it's a good idea, but because I feel it in me. This is part of my experience of being human and I will take responsibility and carry that through into what we create as humans with all kinds of capacity that we can use the technology to give ourselves more spaciousness to become extraordinary, to use our intuition every moment of our day so that the choices that we make are beneficial and collaborative and we aren't mucking about fighting against our own selves and others. It's time to wrap this up. But it's only just occurred to me that I think I really want to have a conversation with chat GPT, which is, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a form of AI where you can have a conversation. And I'd like to ask AI the same questions that I asked the I Ching. I just feel really curious about this. And I'm not going to include that in this episode because I want to get this finished and out before the new moon. So I'm not trying to be exclusive or tricky here, but I will add that conversation over on Patreon. And maybe that will be incentive for you to join me there. And if it's super interesting and I want to keep talking about it, if it sparks something in me, you can be sure it will show up on a future episode here. And so I leave you now to discover your way through these next two weeks, enjoying this new moon time of beginnings, of resolutions. It's 
not a big deal. It's just a two week resolution, though. Some would say that they have big orbits, these new moon resolutions that we make. The angel cards I pulled are harmony and purification. And I would just turn that in. So how do you harmonize with your own inner knowing and your inner desires? And how do you use purification, not so much as a way to, to harm ourselves because there's this whole harming involved with purification, but that using purification more like distillation, can you distill those things that you most value and can you make a commitment to them for this new moon cycle? And I also pulled two more cards, which are devotion bhakti. And that is right from the heart. What does your heart love? How can you sing to those things that your heart loves? How can you dance for them? And humility. And how can we bring ourselves right back to the humanity, that we are humans and that we make mistakes and that repair is essential and it's well worth practicing. Thank you for listening. You may have noticed that I've enabled ads for my podcast and that helps me to produce the show. I'm very happy to report that I have already started accumulating revenue from the ads. Uh, I haven't hit a dollar yet, but I'm very happy that there's something there. And if you share this podcast, that helps increase the ad potential revenue for me. So thank you so much for sharing, for following the podcast. It all helps so much. If you would like to further support me in doing this sort of work, you can find me at patreon.com slash watermoonstudios. Thanks so much and bye for now.